Hey guys, CQ the Watch Guy here. Uh, answer some of your unanswered questions and comments uh, on our Instagram and YouTube videos. Uh, so let's have some fun. Oh, is it sitting there? What do you think about aftermarket customization? This is a very, this is a very interesting one. The thing about customization is it's really for you and it should always be about you. Right, so whether you buy a custom watch or don't buy a custom watch should be your decision and no matter what I say or anybody says, like that should be what matters. You know, I used to work, you know, in the Miami watch jewelry diamond district and uh, I used to sell, you know, a lot of diamond bezels and watches that were like iced out. And to me, it's all about quality, right? I've seen some beautiful, beautiful uh, iced out or all diamond pieces that were aftermarket that were like VS1 diamonds, very, very high quality um, setting, you know, handset pieces, things that just look gorgeous that you can say, okay, I understand it. And I've seen some things that look like frozen spit, you know, that somebody just threw in a watch and somebody's wearing this watch thinking they have a really, really nice watch. That's the situation with custom watches, you have to really do your research and know what you're getting into because you can get something that you think looks beautiful and you're paying a certain amount, but it really for what it is, it, it, it's not what it, it should be and it doesn't look. You just have to do your research, shop around and really kind of learn a little bit about diamond quality, whether this diamond is a real diamond, whether it's a laboratory made diamond, the quality of the diamond, the colors of the diamonds, all these things kind of go into the effect of how the, the end product looks. Honestly, if you just go factory, you'll never lose. The main thing is you'll always be able to move around a factory diamond piece pretty easy because people know what it is. The problem when you buy a custom piece and then you wanna sell it, I don't know what the quality of those diamonds are in that piece. Once, um, once a diamond is set into metal, it can't be really graded as easily because it's set into metal so you can't really shine the light. It's not like a diamond ring where you can just like shine lights in different areas to really get the good quality of your diamond. So that's the problem with, with custom pieces if you want to sell it eventually. On the other side, you have custom pieces like, um, you know, uh, Black In and Titan Black and um, Bamford that are using like DLC coding on their pieces. These are pretty cool. Like my favorite version would be like a two-tone Submariner GAT with GMT with black DLC coding, and you just seen like the, the yellow gold, the rose gold pop. Really great looking watch. I prefer this just because it, it's a different look. It's not really like damaging the watch. If you had to take the watch back from a DLC coding to its original metal, you could be you could do it. It's hard to do it. It costs money to do it, but it can be done. When you when you put diamonds on watches, people don't know like you're actually drilling into the case of that watch. So when you see a 5711 with diamonds all over it, somebody has drilled into the case of that 5711. There is no way to undrill that case and make it whole again. That watch is forever a diamond out watch. With DLC, um, it, it's it's uh, coating over. The, um, the metal, it is difficult to take off, but like if you really, really wanted to, it can be done. If you're going to a high quality uh, manufacturer or customizer of DLC pieces, they can they can do it for you. And I like that because you can have fun with your pieces, make it unique, make it truly yours, but at the end of the day, it's a little easier to move around if you want to change your mind. And um, lastly, like on, on um, hand engraved pieces, like there are a lot of, but, you know, people doing really cool hand engraving of um, Rolexes and APs and things like that. Um, even literally engraved, I saw a cool Royal Oak with the moon engraved. That was pretty awesome. Um, th those are nice as well, because again, it's making your piece yours. You don't really see them everywhere. And it's easier, in my opinion, to move something like that because it's more of a true work of art versus something that's like iced out diamonds. And again, like don't, if you take anything from this, don't buy frozen spit and put it on your wrist and walk around with it. Don't buy a spit. CQ to watch, guy. <laughs> Willer Hutan from YouTube asks, can they make Panerai watches any larger? With big uh, exclamation points there. Um, sure, if they want to. I think if you go back to like the historical catalog of Panerai, they go way above 50 millimeters. So Panerai could do, you know, whatever Panerai wants to do. Whether you will wear that watch is a real question. If a watch isn't for you, it's not for you. I think we have to acknowledge at this point that Panerai has really gone out of its way to make watches that can fit almost any wrist out there with their Douay line and um, a lot of other pieces that they're doing. So if they wanna make, you know, really huge watch that people, you know, like only Sylvester Stallone can wear, that's okay, you know, it's it's their problem from a business standpoint to figure out how to sell those watches. Um, I hope that if they do something like that, they only make one or two, but um, as many 
many brands have proven they just like to make, you know, a lot of everything. But a big watch can be, yes, they can. Ugami Ito from YouTube asked, what kind of fool wants, what kind of fool wants Snoopy on a luxury watch? Ridiculous. I am that fool, Ugami. You know, it's not just Snoopy. You know, even if it was Snoopy, you know what's Snoopy? Snoopy is a characterization of a great show that has really tied together so many people around the world. And the Peanuts still have a following to this day. But you know, let's, let's get off just the peanuts there. Uh, that Snoopy watch is uh, connected and it's the commemoration of the Apollo 13 mission. The Apollo 13 mission showed that in uh, the face of pure disaster, in the face of you know men being stuck in space in everybody's worst nightmare, you know, being stuck, the oxygen's running low, you know, you can't say goodbye to your friends, you can't say goodbye to your family, you know, you're up there, the computers are gone. And what was left, what was left to get everybody back home? It was that Speedmaster. And that 14 second burst, you know, timed perfectly, got the boys back home. And guess what? Snoopy was, you know, the, 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 the icon, I, I forgot the word, but he, uh, Snoopy was connected to the Apollo 13 missions. So that's why that watch is, is, is so special to so many people. It's really special to me because I did have a chance to buy that watch, you know, uh, under retail and uh, you know, because of you know, bad friends and listening to people, you know, my, my biggest one lesson is buy what you love. And the one time that I did not buy what I loved, um, I lost out. You know, I lost out on one, a very, very great watch, a watch that I could have got under 7,500 that is worth you know, over $20,000 today. And honestly, a, just a very, very special connection to um, a very special time in human history. So while you know, it may seem foolish to some to enjoy a watch with Snoopy on it, to many, it resembles a time in humanity when we all came together and make things happen. And uh, that's why I'm the fool who likes Snoopy on my watch. Jatin Marco from Instagram asks, what, what's the purpose of What's the purpose of the crown at 10 o'clock on Omega Seamasters? Um, it's, it's a helium escape valve. So let's say you were a industrial diver and you were going down in a, a diving bell. The air that's in that di diving bell is enriched with helium. Helium is a smaller molecule than oxygen and it will get through um, the gaskets that are inside the watch. If let's say he didn't have that helium escape valve, went up to the top, got out, uh, when the, when it, when everything, when the, the, when the pressure was normalized, the crystal will pop off when you get in the top. The helium escape valves allow, allows for the helium to get out um, when you go on the top. There, there's really no purpose for this watch. I'll be really honest with you. There, there, there was at a time a very, very good purpose for it. Um, if you were an industrial diver, most people who wear a Seamaster 300 have no idea what it, what that's for. There's a few, no. You know, and if you're ever like stuck in a conversation and you don't know how to get out of it and you know somebody has a Seamaster 300, easy icebreaker, hey, do you know what that crown at 10 o'clock does? And uh, that is my somewhat scientific reason for the crown at 10 o'clock on the Omega Seamaster 300. Reno 2, <clears throat> I almost said Reno 901. Reno 2324 from YouTube asks, what would you recommend for a one watch guy? Uh, so to use this as everyday suits, the beach, etc. Oof, that's such like a really, that's a hard question. You know, like the first watches that come to my head, you know, Breitling Chronomat, any size will work for that. Breitling Super Avenger, Avenger, any size will work for that. Rolex, Submariner, you know, anything steel sports Rolex will work for that. Um, Bramont, like I'm wearing not today. Um, actually, yeah, I'd say Bramont. Uh, because you can find this value-wise under 5,000, many different versions. Um, and there are many different Bramants. This one's a supersonic, really cool limited edition, but there are many Bramants uh, that you could wear that are a little bit more dressy. They use a hardened, um, a special case that's hardened um, a little bit harder than normal cases, a little bit more durable. So I'd say like any Bramant would be really good. So many great watches. The first thing that comes to my head, Breitling Chronomats, anything there, because you can strip from, you can switch from strap, brace are really easy, they look cool, they have a unique feel, and you get them at a really good value. Um, Bramants are really good, and if you go Rolex, anything steel, you know, you're gonna have a good time. It's always Teddy. It's always you, Teddy. 
Pilot Style 123 from YouTube asks, what's the difference between a turbion, gyro turbion, and a carousel? Are these 2000 USD Chinese turbions really turbions? All right, so like, let's separate the questions there. The difference between a turbion, a gyro turbion, and a carousel. Um, if you watch my amazing classroom video on the turbion, uh, you will see a great breakdown on turbions, what they do, exactly how it works. Um, in a nutshell, a turbion is a mini anti-gravity machine that is spinning the timekeeping components of the watch um, in 360 degrees um, once every minute to counteract gravity pushing down on the watch. Uh, the gyro turbion is a turbion that not only goes on the normal axis, on one axis, but actually is going in different positions while it's spinning. So it's spinning 360 degrees like this, but also being bounced around slowly in other, you know, you can look up YouTube videos that are better at my hand doing this work claw thing. Um, but that's exactly what it does. The carousel is basically um, a, a different way to do a turbion. Um, and what you, what you have is basically the same situation as a turbion. You have the escapement and everything kind of spinning in there, but then the whole cage that usually holds a turbion in normal watches that is rotating as well. So you have the th turbion that might be spinning once every 60 seconds, and then the cage itself is rotating once, once an hour, um, once every 60 minutes. And that just creates another way to really counteract gravity pushing down on any one way of the escapement. Uh, and just, you know, um, just cool examples of awesome watchmaking, things that we honestly do not need today, but still really fascinating to see when different brands and our watchmakers can put them together in different um, unique combinations and styles. And um, especially the gyro turbions, like if you ever have a chance to see one of those in person, it's, uh, it's crazy, it's insane. You just see it kind of bounce around there. All right, now the second part of that question, are these $2,000 uh, Chinese turbions really turbions? So like, it really depends. For me personally, I don't really like to speak upon brands that I've never touched on, I've never had somebody talk to me about, I've never had the pleasure of enjoying or just looking at. Saying that a lot of these, um, you know, uh, international turbines, whether be from China or whatever, they focus so much. Yes, there are turbines out there for I'm sure like 500 bucks that are technically a turbine, which again is just basically the escapement, all the timekeeping components rotating. Um, what I find though with a lot of these low dollar turbines is you're getting a turbine, yes, but most of the rest of the watch usually is lacking. The dial is usually just um, this big skeletonized dial that you really can't see, and the rest of the watch really isn't an attractive watch, but you do uh, get a turbion. Uh, so it's really a tricky thing. Technically, you can get a, a turbion for $2,000 or even much less, but the real joy of a turbion is having a turbion that is made, um, that is crafted well, and that extends a very nice watch. That is not the whole point of a, of a very nice watch, right? And you know, there, there's nothing wrong with a watch at a lower price point. I've sold watches from $50, you know, you know, to quarter million or more. Um, so there's really nothing wrong with, with, with an inexpensive watch, but when they're, you know, brands saying, hey, uh, it's a turbion, but the rest of the watch, you know, a turbion to me is this really nice component that accents a very nice watch. It's really, you know, it's great to have a turbion, and if you want a turbion, it's great, but it's really meant to accent a very nice timepiece. It's like having a, a V12, a V16, or V22 engine in a Ferrari, but you still want that beautiful Ferrari. You still want that really nice crafted body. You want the interior to be like a race car. You want to feel a certain way. You don't just want this amazing engine in just like a, a bread truck. I think you gotta, you know, if you're gonna buy something, buy what you enjoy. If you want a, a Turbion that's that price point and you like how it looks, buy it. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things where it's cool, it can be appreciated by a, a large community, a smaller community can actually afford it and wear it. Um, but to me, if you're gonna go for a Turbion, go for something that actually looks good, regardless of the price point. Um, and that is my, uh, my long answer to that short question. This is CQ The Watch Guy. I wanna thank you guys for watching. Feel free to put more uh, comments and uh, questions out there so we can do this again. This was fun. Feel free to follow me on Instagram, CQ underscore the watch guy, and uh, shoot me a message. I always love to hear from fans.